morning and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Mike Lewis. I'm the uh, 2017 president of BizFed, and I'm filling in today because our current president has uh, had some surgery and a little bit uh, a rehabilitation. And our executive director also had some surgery, so she's out uh, uh, nursing up on me. And uh, so I, everything has fallen to me to, to step into the breach. Um, if I can, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge our founding uh, chairman of uh, his David Fleming, who is here. And my duty this morning is to, uh, to introduce the moderator for our, no our next panel. But uh, first, I wanted to. Uh, applaud the BizFed Institute for bringing this important topic into the public consciousness. And I want to ass uh, assure you that today's presentations are just the very first step in tackling the uh, housing shortage in Los Angeles County. Uh, for me, the next step is to take the ideas that are discussed today and develop them into a policy document that becomes the advocacy platform for BizFed. And to take that same document and hand it off to our BizFed pack so that they can use it with the city council candidates that they endorse to begin building a consensus amongst elected officials to do their part to address the problem. But I'd like to highlight uh, a little bit the severity of the problem as I see it and to share with you some facts and some concerns that I have about the direction that we're trying to take. In our region, as you heard this morning, the average home price is two and a half times the national average. Apartment rents are 50% higher than the national average. Renters are spending 48% of their income on housing. In Los Angeles, the zoning code is 70 years old. There are 35 out-of-date community plans, and there are 96 neighborhood councils protecting their short-sighted vision of the future of Los Angeles based on a somewhat narrow view of, uh, from their neighborhood. Housing production is near an all-time low. Termites are eating our houses faster than we're producing them. <laughs> In 1960, the residential population of Los Angeles, uh, based on the zoning, was 10 million. Uh, today, it's 4.2 million. The actual population is 3.9 million. There's no ability to deliver what our leaders have promised in the way of housing, and I think they know that. The facts don't match the political rhetoric. This is unsustainable, and we are already seeing the effects. California lost 170,000 residents net to other states in the last three years. Virtually all of them came from Los Angeles. California has the most super rich, people with a net worth of over $30 million, and 30% of all the welfare recipients in the country, with just 10% of the population. Los Angeles ranks third in the nation for the loss of millennial residents. Since 2001, job growth in science, technology, engineering and math has been 10.3 percent. In the Bay Area, it's 12 percent. In San Antonio, it's 31 percent. In Houston, 36 percent. In Dallas, 38 percent. And in Austin, 52 percent. That's the future middle class. We are missing out. And the facts, again, don't match the political rhetoric. Land is not scarce. The entire population of the United States could fit in Texas with more than one acre for every household. So I repeat, land is not scarce. For most Americans, the largest component of their net worth is the equity in their home. Without good jobs, there's no home ownership. Without home ownership, there's no middle class. With no middle class, there's no civic participation. And we are already seeing that in declining voter turnout and community apathy. <clears throat> we are unwisely pushing a policy of densification even though it's the most expensive housing to build. Why would we build housing that has to sell for $500 a square foot in the urban core when you can sell it for two to $300 a square foot in the suburbs? If you look at the demographic changes in the last 15 years, America has become less urban, but the urban areas have become richer, younger, and whiter. The facts, again, don't match the political rhetoric. Now our state planners are pushing a narrative that vehicle miles traveled is bad, that we need a road diet, that this is all good for the environment. But they don't consider the capacity expanding effects of autonomous vehicles, zero emission vehicles, 
drone deliveries, virtual offices, or that the freedom of mobility is a sacred, almost a civil right in this country, and I don't believe you're going to be able to limit it. Again, the facts don't match the political rhetoric. <clears throat> the contradiction between the facts and the political rhetoric is going to encourage more ballot box planning and more efforts to pull up the drawbridge and further exacerbate the housing shortage and the gap between the haves and the have-nots. <coughs> We need an all of above housing policy. It needs to include more density, more greenfield development, second units, small lot subdivisions, affordability incentives, micro units, home sharing, CEQA reform, by right development, and we need to reassess the extraordinary fees that we expect new home builders, the new home buyers, to pay in order to solve pre existing community problems. The risk of not developing a comprehensive housing plan will be to change our iconic Hollywood sign to, into a no vacancy sign. <laughs> this next panel, digging for answers to get shovels in the ground, there's nobody better to tackle that than our, our moderator, Mr. Mel Wilson. Many of you may know something about him, but you probably don't know everything about him. Uh, he is no the <laughs> he is the broker owner of uh, Mel Wilson Associates in Northridge. He is a former NFL and Kodak All-American football player. He served on the MTA board appointed by both Mayor Reardon and Mayor Villacarosa. He's been a national leader in the real estate industry and in the National Association of Realtors. He's a civic activist, having been a founding member of the Valley Economic Alliance and served as a member of the LA City Fire Commission and the LA City Business Tax Advisory Commission. He's quite simply, to many people, Mr. Real Estate. Please welcome Mel Wilson. Thanks, Mike. Oh boy, he started me off right, didn't he? Uh, here's my back. Anybody got some spears you want to throw back here? <laughs> Mike started the fireworks here. All right, uh, Mel Wilson, it's so good to see you. But before I uh, go into our panel, I'd like to just reintroduce someone who did not get introduced uh, this morning and one of, the, one of the partners and sponsors of this event, and that is the president of the Southland Regional Association of Realtors, Gina Uzunian. Gina? <laughs> I don't think this is on, is it? No. There it is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if, there are a number of realtors here, but let me just find out how many folks are here who are housing developers. Can I see your hand? Housing developers, one. Any uh, nonprofit organizations here represented? Very good. Uh, any uh, realtors here? Realtors? Very good. Any homeowner activists here? Neighborhood groups? Very good. So we got a good, good mix here. Uh, we have a, a panel here that I think there, there's going to be a little passion. I uh, was on a conference call this Monday, and Bill Wong was on the phone, and he had some real passion. So I want you to <laughs> unleash it. Let it out, right? And Sandy, uh, Sandy Brown over here, she has a little bit of passion too. So I want you to just, we're going to be open. We're going to have a nice dialogue about uh, this really important issue. We're not going to make it personal, right? This is societal. We all are in this together. And I think the solution lies in us all working together. Let me uh, share, if I can, uh, a couple of stats that Mike did not articulate. And that is that the affordability factor is moving downwards. Moving downwards, it's about 30% of the county's population can afford to actually own a home today. And over 625,000 folks in California moved out over the last six years. And they are moving out principally because the cost of housing. We have some generational changes that are occurring right as we speak. Now, I am a baby boomer. Any boomers out there? Very good. Any Gen Xs out there? Any millennials out there? Millennials rule. <laughs> they are the largest population group ever, and we need to start getting with it. Boomers are retiring out at a pace of 10,000 a day, turning 65 years old. 
for the next decade. So we need to talk about some of the generational changes that are occurring. It's pretty scary, but we really need to talk about it. And we need to talk about some of the things that are happening as a result of this squish of folks all moving closer to each other. We have a homeless problem in our region. And it's not going to go away just by us wishing it will go away. The voters voted uh, a week ago to put up about $1.2 billion for housing for homeless in LA City. But guess what? We have a whole county. LA County is about 11 million people. LA City, about 4 million people. So we're not going to even have a drop in the bucket to this solution from this housing uh, bill that passed uh, uh, last uh, Tuesday. There's another thing that's going on, a phenomenon, and that is ballot box planning. People are planning their future based on what they hear, and they come to the voting booth and they vote based on what they may have read or heard, and some of what they are hearing is not all truthful. So we need to educate more, and we need to legislate less. That's my view of the world. Educate more, legislate yet less, right? Is that right? Y'all with me? OK. So we have to figure out how to do some of these generational things. Uh, I am, uh, as I said, a boomer. And you know my kids all wanted to move in home with me. And they did for a while. And then I gave them all a six month notice so they had to get out. <laughs> and guess what? They grumbled. They didn't like it, but they got out. And now they're living not by themselves, but they're sharing apartments and rooms with other folks. And that's kind of what's going on. And the folks who would be my parents, my mom, thank God, you know, she's not here to deal with all this anymore. But guess what? She would be at the age now where she would live with me or be in an assisted care facility, which is not a part of my family style. So she would be living with me. And so we don't even have a, a forum for folks who are generational uh, seniors to move in with their kids. You know, there's no granny flat kind of an ordinance that people can actually do that. And I will tell you something. You may not like it. And I talked to uh, Sandy and I, was it Barbara? Yeah. Yes, Barbara and Sandy. And, you know, so we're not going to call them Yimbies anymore, Nimbies, okay? They don't want to be called Nimbies. So we don't want to be rude and call people what they're not. Right? We want to have a dialogue with everybody in here, and I want you to all be respectful of each other. You may not agree with their opinions, but that's okay. This is America. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, with that, uh, you have your handout, which has a little bit of a bio on each one of the presenters here, and I'm going to start out in the alphabetical order, and I think that's a B. So, Sandy, you're on. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank BizFed for the invitation to join you today. And interestingly enough, um, I have been involved in community activism for 40 years. So I've, I've really run the gamut of neighborhood councils, community councils, homeowner associations. I have never, ever been in an audience where anyone from housing has come to speak to any of the groups that I've been involved in. Um, we, get, we get a lot of calls from people running for office. We, we hear about um, things that are going to be presented at city council, but I have never had any housing advocate come to any one of the meetings that I've attended. So I would suggest that you get out into the neighborhoods um, where people are there to listen. Let, let the leader know that you would like some time to speak, not five minutes, but maybe 20 minutes with a question and answer period to get your education out to the public. And then we can deliver it to those residents that we represent. Um, I have the distinct honor, and I call it an honor, of representing the NIMBY family today. And I can tell you that there is a lot of work ahead for you to turn all of us into YIMBYs. Um, we have been NIMBYs for a long time. Um, it's, it's not easy to convert us. Um, I bring somewhat of a different perspective because of my 40 years. And eventually, you're going to have to face us in the neighborhoods if you want to get your housing built in our neighborhoods, because we're very keen on what you're looking for, what you want to do. Um, we're very um, educated as well as to what is going on in the city. 
Um, I am president of an 1100 single family home homeowner association. I'm represented also in our neighborhood council in Westwood. And by the way, I served as chief of staff for State Senator Tom Hayden when he was in the State Senate. So I also have some state perspective as well. Um, but eventually you're gonna have to meet with me, um, but once you've secured your building site and financing, but probably after you've met with the planning department and city council. Um, I'm a, a firm believer in the sooner that you come to speak with the neighborhood where you are intending and want to go, the, the easier it's going to be for you and for us as well. Um, I hope that you do begin that process early on. Um, by definition, NIMBYs are usually reactive rather than proactive. We don't own the property. Um, we don't rent the property. We, we, we are there already, so in, it is our general nature to be reactive. Um, over the years, uh, we have been fooled by elected officials, by speculators, by developers, and by attorneys. So our antennae are up. Our fears are, are real from my perspective, perhaps not from your perspective, but certainly from my perspective. Uh, we've also become more educated about appeals, community plans, specific plans, and initiatives. We are also tuned in to the Great Streets, Smart Streets, SB 1818, smart growth and transit corridors. And they might mean something in City Hall, but when they come out to the community, it's like, oh, here comes another name, you know, another name for a beautiful street or smart streets to get traffic moving. And we follow these things, and this doesn't happen. It, 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 it's a nice term to use, but really the people in the neighborhoods have just kind of tossed it aside, and it has very little meaning. Um, I do believe, honestly, that we understand the necessity for affordable housing. Um, I, I don't think anyone doesn't understand the necessity of it. It's a question of, of educating us and, and getting us to understand the seriousness of what it means to a city to not address affordable housing issues. Um, we, we, we have our own issues, as you well know. Communities have many issues. And I must tell you at this point in time, affordable housing is not on the top of the list. It's probably on the very bottom of our list. Um, our things are more immediate. We're, we're not educated about affordable housing. So we're not gonna put it way up there. And so you've got an extra amount of work to do. And it's been discussed about the infrastructures uh, crumbling, how overcrowded our schools are. And certainly in Westwood where I live, traffic is at gridlock. Communities that we could get to in five or 10 minutes now take us 45 or 50 minutes to get to. And we've also found that in many cases there is zero enforcement from our city uh, services. Um, the transit corridors um, obviously are the new buzzwords for creating density. Some transportation corridors today in my neighborhood specifically are at gridlock. So while you talk about building housing on transit corridors so that people will have the opportunity to just walk out their door and get to where they're going easily. Um, they do provide more congestion in my community. Additional housing does, certainly. Uh, more traffic, larger class sizes in our schools, greater demand on police and fire, need for more water and power, and the list goes on. We get, we get the need for affordable housing but the reality is that this housing often contributes to our problems in the community. Um, UCLA happens to be in my community. Any given day, there are 70,000 people on campus at UCLA. That, that's, that's a pretty big number. We have 940 buses that traverse about six blocks in order to get people to where they need to be. So. Um, that, that's, a, that's a pretty high number. And on that same street, 35,000 car trips. So when you talk about building affordable housing and adding to that congestion, guys, there's just no room. There is no room in West, on Westwood Boulevard to do that kind of thing. Um, people who live along transit corridors, I believe, have, have need for cars. Kids have to get to school. Sometimes people want to take vacations. And when you plan 
affordable housing with very little parking. There's no street parking in Westwood. There is no on-street parking. So where do these people park their cars? Parking is expensive to put in. We get that. But nevertheless, there is a certain level of realism that has to go with building affordable housing. Um, what should we, what should we ex ask you to expect from our neighborhoods, and how will you get the support that you need? I think, first of all, you must understand that we do have our issues, and you, that you, needed to be, you need to be sensitive to them and knowledgeable about them. You need to read not only the, the, the plans downtown, but our specific plans, our community plans, our multifamily plans. We have plans in place, and they are old from the late 80s. They're outdated, but that's all we have. We don't have any other availability to change those plans until the city decides to take it up. So, so, San so Sandy, <coughs> they have a plan here they've asked me to follow, and that is to move on to the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was being, being quick. Thank you, but hold on to that. We're gonna give you time to, to share that. Uh, Stephanie, you are up. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to follow Sandy. This is really thrilling. Um, my name is Stephanie Caldwell. I work for the LA County Department of Public Health. I'm the chief of staff there at that department. And I just want to talk to you guys. I think I have two to three minutes, so I'm going to talk kind of quick. But I'm happy to take questions when we have a moment, or even after this event. Um, so I want to talk to you about the nexus between housing and people's health, OK? Community level health. Individual health plus our community level health. So the first thing I want to show you is a pie chart. Please, God. All right, here we go. So this pie chart is really like a snapshot of all of the factors that underlie what your personal individual health um, kind of stems from, as well as your community's health stems from. So you can see up here, because you guys are all business people, you know percentages. You can see up here that um, about 50% of this pie really draws down your health, so your morbidity, mortality, your life expectancy, how well you live it, um, the quality with which you're be being able to live your life relates down to your social and economic factors. So those are things like education, employment, your income level, your community cohesion, your feeling of social connectedness, and safety, okay? Those are social and economic factors. That contributes about 40% to your overall health and well-being. Massive. The, there's another 10% that contributes to your health, that's the physical environment. So that's if you have adequate quality, stable housing, if you have access to transportation, um, if you have clean water, air, and all of those types of natural amenities, right? There's a portion of your factors that um, influence your health is genetic, like where you come from, your heredity. Um, and then there's clinical care, access to that, getting preventive services, and your health behaviors. If you choose to smoke, if you choose to not exercise, those types of things. Um, the new frontier of public health is really focused on social and economic factors as well as the built environment in which people live because we know that that has the most influence over what your health outcomes are going to be. Okay. Next. Um, so we put out a report and usually I would drone through the report but I have one minute so I'm not going to. <laughs> it looks like this. It's on the front table. We brought copies for everyone. Bring one for you and a friend. Um, it essentially breaks down the connection between housing and health into three major areas. Housing affordability, housing stability. Can you stay in the same place that you want to stay in or do you have to move often? Or are you so at risk that you fall into homelessness? That's what stability means. And then housing quality. Is your house um, health promotive or health destructive? Um, so there's a bunch of data and factors in our report that I would encourage you to check out that tell you all of the things that if you are in un unaffordable housing, there are negative impacts on your personal and your community's health. If you're in instable housing, there are a lot of negative health factors that come from instable housing, particularly among youth and adolescents. Okay, there's research that has shown that if kids are moving often, they're breaking their social networks, their peer networks, which are essential to brain and growth development, um, as well as like just having the stress and anxiety of being in new places all the time, school absenteeism, which can lead to reduced funding for your school systems because schools are paid based on the butts and the seats, okay? Um, housing quality is a massive challenge for public health concerns with overcrowding. Um, both, both speakers talked about how there are a lot of need for um, people to 
potentially double up or live with other folks um, just for generational needs, the sh changing demographics, young people not being able to afford their own place, older people not being able to stay in place. Um, so housing quality plays a big role. Next slide. Super boring to everybody here, but really important to me, is that our Department of Public Health has 4,600 employees, okay? We have 37 programs. We're organized into four bureaus, health protection, health promotion, and disease control, and then operation support. We have over 85 locations across LA County where we provide services, and we have a range of roles in the public health department. We have housing and, and restaurant inspections. You guys have heard of those, right? Um, we have epidemiologists, we have school nurses, we have nurses that go into the community and track down disease. They check people's fridges for like if they've eaten the cheese. Um, so we have a range of roles in our department. We launched in 2015 an internal initiative for the entire Department of Public Health, not just a few of us, but the entire department to begin to work on housing issues in their specific area. So we did that Stephanie? through this six framework. I'm going to adhere to Pass one of those up. rules and turn it over to Manny. Thank you. I'm Manny Gonzalez. I'm the managing principal of KTGY's uh, right now in Playa Vista office. We're residential architects and I've been doing residential design for almost 30 years. A lot of it is on the age qualified side and I joke that I started in this business 25 years ago designing homes for old people, and now I do a focus group on my wife and myself when I go home. <laughs> but I, I want to share a few communities and a few ideas with you that, that I've been involved with along the way. So the next slide. This is Angeles Plaza. I don't know how many of you know Angeles Plaza. It's downtown LA and Bunker Hill. It's the country's largest age-qualified affordable community with nearly 1,100 units, 1,300 residents in that community. We re recently renovated it, and we had to go through each floor, refinish it, and then they started moving people in and or back into that vacant floor. Started a waiting list. 4,200 people signed up on the waiting list. 2,000 of them qualified. They're still on the waiting list. The vacancy factor is about eight vacancies a month. The last guy on that list is going to take 24 years to get into that building. The other thing that I think is really important, people touched on it earlier, but the, the residents that are in this that are living in affordable senior housing. Some point in time, a lot of them are going to need memory care and assisted living, and there is no affordable memory care and assisted living out there, and I think that's going to be one of the country's biggest problems going forward. You can't even get tax credits for it. So I think we've got to start looking at that because it's going to become a big, big problem. The next community up here, these are two City of LA small lot communities that we've done. The interesting thing about these, if you don't know, you can take a residential lot and it now allows you to up the density and these would have been a duplex and we're building 18 units on it. Getting 40 units to the acre if you guys know about density and it's really a great opportunity. I will say one of the things that I've been telling the city of LA they did wrong, they allowed the city of LA parking requirements to be used. You could put a full size and a compact in a, call it a two car garage. A compact space in the city of LA is seven and a half feet wide, full size is nine feet wide. You could do a 16 and a half foot wide garage and call it a two car garage. The residents around the neighborhood, like you see, Andy, would understand that you can't park two cars in there unless you got two Mini Coopers. So one car goes out on the street and all of a sudden there's no street parking. So one of the things the city should do is make it at least 18 feet wide so you can park two cars in it. But that being said, doing this right is really a great opportunity to provide affordable housing. I think LA is the only city that really does it right now. So I think it's important if you have local neighborhoods and you're trying to do things and increase the amount of affordable housing, having opportunities like these small lot ordinances are really a great way to provide affordable housing. The last slide up here is just a couple of things that I'm, I, I advocate when I go into communities or meet with people like Sandy, but you could see on the right, that's me talking about a site plan that I was working on with the neighborhood. The site plan hadn't even been drawn. I sat there during the day talking to the neighbors and creating that site plan. Then we brought other neighbors in and discussed what we had created. The other one on the top, the dots, another technique I like to use with neighborhoods. When you're going in and talking about architecture and the style of building, we'll put up pictures up there of different styles of architecture before we've even drawn anything. Give the residents the dots. The ones that you like, put a green dot. The ones that you don't like, put a red dot. If you don't care, put a yellow dot. 
and we save those so we use them over the course of time. Now on the developer side, make sure that the, the images that are up there are ones that you want to build, that they're affordable to build. And the one other thing, don't put a two-story building up there if you're planning on building a four-story building. The last one up here is the Google car. There are 13,000 cabs in New York City. The goal is to introduce 7,000 autonomous cars in New York City to replace those 13,000. It's cutting the amount of cabs on the street almost in half because you don't need them anymore. You don't, the, the problem is there's a downside. Now you've got 40,000 drivers without a job. Anyway, uh, I, I'm very glad to be here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, you're up, Bill. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Mel, after hearing about your background, I lost all my passion. No. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm totally uh, humbled. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Bill Wong. I'm the Director of Housing and Career Services for the City of Pasadena. I'm, uh, I used to be the county's housing director. Uh, prior to that, I was an affordable housing uh, developer and architect. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I, I didn't bring my PowerPoint here, but let me just look. Uh, so Pasadena, what, what's going on? I just uh, put some things down. Uh, that are working in Pasadena. So Pasadena um, has inclusionary housing, uh, and we also have a lot of transit-oriented development, and these two things are, are working together um, very well. Currently, right now, uh, we have 118 um, inclusionary units under construction. Uh, many, many, many of them, probably most of them, are in transit-oriented districts. Um, let's see. Uh, we have been addressing homelessness. Uh, this is our our chart from 2007 to uh, 2016. So in 2012, uh, we made a real paradigm shift. Um, uh, we started to focus on uh, things that either prevent homelessness or end homelessness. Uh, it's not rocket science, but the only thing that ends homelessness is a permanent home. Uh, and so uh, we focused on permanent supportive housing, homeless prevention, um, a program called uh, Housing First, where we take the most uh, chronic homeless individuals, um, those who are most likely to die. We actually go out there and create a registry of those who are most likely to die and put them directly into housing, um, permanent housing, with supportive services. And over the last five years, we've housed uh, over 200. Uh, the average tenure of homelessness was 10 years. And, um, uh, and it's been very, very successful. So our numbers have gone down um, over, uh, over 50%. During that same time period, over the last six years, the, uh, the county homeless numbers have gone up by about 35%. Next, please. And uh, so, so what can be done um, to help improve the situation? Um, uh, with, with the most recent election, I would just say that, the, uh, that I believe HUD just got listed on the endangered species list. Um, so that's something that needs to be done, be, be, being taken care of. Uh, uh, we need a statewide Palmer fix. Those of you who in, in, uh, follow inclusionary zoning, um, inclusionary zoning has been impaired by the Palmer case. Um, uh, Governor Brown had the opportunity to fix that, and he vetoed the bill. Uh, a new bill hasn't gotten up to him, and the Palmer fix just says local jurisdictions, cities, and counties have the right, if they so choose, to do so. You want to tell them what inclusionary zoning yeah, is? Yeah, inclusionary zoning is uh, in Pasadena. Uh, it's, it's pretty typical. Uh, any multifamily developer, apartment developer, or condo developer of 10 units or more needs to set aside 15% of the units as affordable. Or they could pay, or they can pay a fee. Uh, the fee is not small. We're talking to one developer that's looking at a $13 million fee. Um, and that money then gets used to build more affordable housing. Um, and then we need to utilize what, what's been brought up. We need to utilize our R1 zoning. Uh, most of the residential zone land in uh, the county is R1 zone. And um, uh, I know in Pasadena there was a study that was done that looked at, in the midst of a housing crisis, what, what areas of the county are the most overhoused? That is, one person living in a three bedroom house, one person living in a four bedroom. What areas in Pasadena was one, the Pasadena single family zone is one of those areas that was identified as the most overhoused. So if the majority of our land in the county is R1, we should come up with some solutions that can help to um, engage that, that land. Uh, shared housing, um, uh, accessory dwelling units, those kinds of things um, are possible. Um, and absolutely, I agree, uh, development takes too long and costs too much um, and is too complicated. Uh, but uh, we should also remember that the price that is set, either the rental price or the 
acquisition price, purchase price of a house, is set by the market. So just because we reduce costs, if, if interest rates go down, or if construction material costs go down, or if government fees go down, I'm in favor of all of that. It doesn't mean that the developer will then lower the purchase price. Right? Where, the, where the costs really come into play is when developers have to decide, like I was in a meeting yesterday with a developer trying to decide, you know, should I go or no go on a project? I have, you know, I think I can get $650,000 per unit. I need to make sure, can I build it? Plus my margin, is, there, is that less than 650 or not? So that's where costs come into play. Go, no go kind of decisions. It doesn't directly, it could in the long run, but it doesn't directly and immediately, especially when we have so much affordable housing uh, need, reduce the, the purchase price directly. That's, that's my own point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. Mark, you're up. Hi, thanks. Thanks to the organizers and to my fellow uh, panelists today. I'm, I'm here, I guess, to give you hope that there are YIMBYs in Los Angeles and we're growing and that we want to work with more of you to basically change the conversation around housing and change the politics of housing. Um, so I helped found a group called Abundant Housing LA last year and um, basically uh, we, we advocate for more housing of all types in Los Angeles area and we do it because we want people who live here to be able to stay here and we want people who might want to move here to be able to come here and pursue their dreams as people have done for over 100 years to come to Southern California and reinvent themselves and you know um, do, good, do good things and collaborate with other people here and also to obviously to reduce a lot of the challenges that were discussed in the first panel in terms of excessive housing costs, um, you know, people not being able to live close to where they work, all the kinds of things that, that are dragging dragging us down despite all the other potential we have as a region and as a, and as a state. You go, go to the next uh, slide. And again, this is just to recapitulate uh, what was said earlier, that the main cost of our housing challenges and housing crisis is essentially a decades of underbuilding that was intentionally done through policy, right? This was decisions were made to down zone, to make it more difficult, to make it more expensive, to make places off limits, you know, and we're now reaping those you know, reaping the outcome today, and it's hurting, hurting all of us in, in, in many ways, especially the most, most vulnerable populations in Southern California. And so in terms of what we as people who want more housing, you know, think should be done, I, I tend to think of it kind of as, this, as, as a pyramid, where at the very base of it is the idea we have to have more housing. Okay? Um, that's not all that we need to do. But if we don't do that, then none of these other solutions work. They all crumble, essentially, if you don't have an adequate supply that is meeting the population growth and also making up for past underbuilding, right? So we need to build more housing of all types, market rate, affordable, permanent supportive, um, you know, uh, innovative things like co-ops and you know, building groups and things like that. We also need to have adequate subsidies for people who can't afford to, to, to rent or buy the products that are provided by the market. And that can be subsidies directly to families and households, or it can be subsidies to developers to you know, create you know, deed-restricted affordable housing. And unfortunately, we are in a political situation for the last several years and into the future where we don't have adequate federal and state funds. We have to be creative to think about how we do that. And I'm proud that Abundant Housing LA supported uh, Prop HHH in the city of LA and that that passed, and we can build upon that. And we need to enforce rights for people who rent and own, right? The individuals, households who are you know, facing eviction pressures or, or challenges with their mortgage, whatever, and also people who are not able to have challenges to render by because of who they are, their identities. We need to make sure we're, we're enforcing all our important rules. And we also need to innovate to bring down the cost of producing housing through different types of materials and you know, types of production, innovate in terms of lifestyles and you know, living arrangements. But again, if we don't have enough housing, all of those things don't work. The subsidies, we, we don't get subsidies if we don't have market rate production. We'll never, never build enough. The rights, there's a pressure on tenants if we don't have enough. And if we don't have enough, you know, the new ways of doing things won't, won't make up for the shortfall. So uh, we're here to work with everyone who wants more housing in LA and look forward to collaborating with, with many of you in the future. Thank you all. So uh, what are your greatest fears uh, with this challenge that we have ahead of us? You can, uh, Mark? Uh, well, the <laughs> I mean, the fears are that we do more of the same, essentially, that um, we talk about housing crisis when we see housing, you know, homelessness numbers go up or we see rents go up. We, aren't, we don't have the political coalition available to change the rules. And by that, I mean, essentially, um, upzoning, 
you know, upzoning, that's my number one goal in the city of Los Angeles, is making it um, vastly increasing the housing capacity that can be built on, on lots throughout the city, so there's no pressures in one certain area that lead to gentrification, lead to displacement. Um, need to have the process of the planning process and the development process be much quicker. Um, we need to use our money smarter. We need to do public land smarter for affordable housing. And um, you know, we need to, to, to essentially make sure that when we're talking about housing, we're talking about not as housing units, but as, as families and as homes and people having you know, wonderful memories from their homes. We need to tap into that empathy and make sure that we're allowing more housing to be built. Great, thank you. And Sandy, on the other side, uh, what are your greatest fears? Well, I can see, I can see that we have a, a big gap between where Mark is and where I am because when I, when I hear, when I hear upzoning, you know, in my community, upzoning, I, I don't know how we would get out of our house with upzoning. But um, I think we can work together, and I think there may be a middle ground uh, that that we can reach, hopefully. Thank you. I love your openness. Uh, Stephanie, tell us what are some of your fears that uh, we continue on the direction that we're at. Sure. I think that um, if there's a lack of affordable housing and there's a really narrow rental market and people are dangerously housed, meaning that they're very unstably housed and potentially could become homeless. Um, we're talking about families, we're talking about single adults. Uh, that's my biggest fear, is that our homeless problem continues to grow and then it becomes a drain on some of our social service investments. Um, and that's just a challenge that does not seem to be going away unless we can prevent homelessness and support the, the current homeless population with per, you know, providing supportive services. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And Bill, um, on the inclusionary zoning side, and the, uh, I would suppose that you're a linkage fee uh, supporter as well? Uh, passing doesn't have a linkage fee, but it's something we're considering. Yes. Okay, so given that we have to have uh, an increase in production of housing, and affordable housing really is not that affordable for the developers, it seems. Mm -hmm. So how can we make affordable housing more affordable for developers? Um, well, first, I think when, when you think about inclusionary zoning and, and linkage fees, it has to be uh, tied to some specific areas. You know, if you, uh, uh, the, the uh, opponents of inclusionary housing or linkage fees will say it's, a, it's an impediment to development. And it absolutely can be. If, we, if you look at in Pasadena, we have an inclusionary housing ordinance. There's an entire quadrant of the city it doesn't apply to because that area hasn't had any market rate investment in decades. But in the other areas, uh, yeah, the opponents came in and said, you're going to kill multifamily development uh, if you adopt this uh, inclusionary ordinance. And it barely passed by a single majority. It was very controversial. But we've had two tremendous building booms uh, in multifamily housing. And right now, we have a gigantic building boom going on. So in areas where there is a strong market, then I think, I think that's where it makes sense to put in inclusionary fees and uh, linkage fees, those kind of things, where the market can absorb it and there's strong demand. But in other areas, I don't think there should be a blanket-wide one, for instance, across the whole county. Thank you. Manny, a uh, uh, different question for you. Uh, Manny, uh, you came up with a creative idea on how uh, parking and the impact on parking is causing folks to be more on the NIMBY side than the YEMBY side. Can you think of any other land use policies and development policies that, that are creative that we maybe are not thinking about that could add more uh, pr uh, protection for neighborhoods, but at the same time increase the production? Well, that's a task. If I had that, I could retire. That's a great, that'd be a, a, the silver bullet, I think. But, I, I, you know, I was going to say, I think the one thing that's probably our biggest problem, going back to that other question, is misguided legislation. Because one thing that, that nobody mentioned today was the dissolution of the redevelopment agencies, because that absolutely killed affordable housing. It's much harder for anybody to do that now. When you were asking Bill about the affordable housing being not profitable, the builders that are building, the developers that are building a community that has 15% low income, that 15% is probably not profitable to them. The people that build affordable housing, it's a, it is a profitable business. Even the, even the nonprofit pay people and make money. But I think that when we start putting out legislation without thinking about the consequences of doing it, that's what really affects us. And unfortunately, I think someone was telling me about the, the Redevelop redevelopment agencies. It was like mutual Omaha's wild kingdom. And you know, you're looking around for what animal you can eat. And the, you know, the, 
the, they're going after the wildebeest. It's a slow thing that can't move, and that's what redevelopment was. You're not going to go after teachers. You're not going to go after firemen. You're not going to go after uh, police. You're going to go after the one that nobody advocates for. So I think you know, when we're talking about what this group can do, advocating for that, I really think, is the key thing. And I think getting rid of some of those legislations that hinder it is another big factor. CEQA, I mean, CEQA is probably the biggest hurdling block. We, we have haven't now. heard anything about CEQA at all today.